You guys ready for the word? You sure? All right. Will you stand for the reading of God's word? Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Got to get your lunges in. Okay, so the reason we stand, we're going to be reading out of John 10. And the reason we stand and we read is just this attuning to God. Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want you to read the scriptures. I want the Holy Spirit to speak through his word, not mine. That's why we do this every Sunday. So let's begin reading the word of God and you listen closely. All right, John 10, 1. Very truly I tell you. Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by any other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate. Did you get that? You got it? This is the word of the Lord. Is it? Do you want to hear the word of the Lord? All right, let's shut that off. Here's what it says. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go out and they will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock and and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So as we entered into the reading of the word, you guys hear it clearly first? Could you hear me? Could you get the point of the scripture? Or were you watching MSNBC, Fox News, reality TV, mumble rap, Joel Osteen, whoever is up there? Today, I want to talk about the voices in our heads, the voices we listen to. And how hard it is to hear the voice of God when you're listening to all your other voices that are leading you. This, this passage, the one that stuck out, stuck out to me, said, the sheep know my voice. They know it. They know how I sound. They know how, what I would say. They know where I would be. They know where I would go. They know what I'm calling them to. The ones who follow Christ know his voice truly. And anybody else who tries to say something that does not line up with how the shepherd would speak, they do not follow. In fact, they run away. 
Today's message is called, How Following Your Leaders Can Go Bad. You know, we have a problem with this idea of sheep. Sheep in the way we use it typically means an idiot. You know, somebody who just follows suit. You just follow, you know, if, I, if you ever go to a t- two left turn lane and everybody's in one and nobody's in the other one and you're just like sheep. Like you guys didn't even look. You could go over here, you know. But that's usually the context we think of it. I've always kind of cringed at this in church. People go, oh, the sheep of God. I'm like, I'm not stupid. At least I didn't think I was. You know, like I don't like, I never liked that term. What's interesting about sheep is um, when you, they've actually done these studies with sheep where they're not nearly as stupid and docile as we think they are. Uh, sheep, actually, they've, they've done tests with them where they can uh, follow a maze and learn a maze and 22 days later come back and remember exactly how that maze went. They, uh, they tend to form little coalitions and choose to leave their leaders if they want to. They're called subcommittees of church. Uh, they, they, they have a mind of their own at times. And at times they're very obedient. At times they follow the shepherd. They're not as stupid as we make them out to be, but they do need a guiding shepherd. Today I want to look at three, I'm going to look at four things, three of them I'm going to breeze through pretty quickly because I want to focus on one that I think we need to touch on a little more, but we're going to talk about what voice should you follow, and what voice are you following? First of all, what voice should you follow? We don't follow your party's voice, or we don't follow your political voice, voices, okay? And this is important because that's, that's why I put it up there. I don't care what you're listening to, so often the anger and vitriol and uh, other sideism of what we listen to becomes the dominant voice in our head. In fact, it becomes so dominant that when I read scripture, I'm only reading part. And when I hear people speak, I'm only hearing part. It's one I'm particularly sensitive to because I'll give you an example. Uh, Not too long ago, when we were experiencing a lot of racial division I didn't join anybody's side. I actually, and I didn't take a verse and use a verse to try to teach something on it. I actually took a context, an issue within the Bible that had to be addressed in the early church. And it was a context of people based on their ethnicity being treated differently. And Paul says to Peter, who was a great leader, that Peter, you're basically, and he could tell him, you're being racist. And if you know the gospel... If you understand what the cross, and I got to the gospel, I said, if the cross has reconciled you, then there is no way you should be okay with these people being treated differently or less than. In fact, you should be with them, building bridges, crossing lines. It was fully in context. And I had people leave and go, oh, Nick's gone left. Oh, Nick's preaching a social gospel. He got away from the gospel. I literally was quoting the Bible. But it wasn't the Bible to them anymore. I didn't use any phrases from the liberal left. I didn't say support this action or this group. I simply said, at the heart of our Christianity, Paul says, if you have been reconciled by the cross, you will be reconcilers of these racial and social and economic and ethnic differences in your world. Because it bridges all of us together at the foot of the cross. And you cannot stand to be in a, pro, in a system that says these people are less than and over here and we're over here. It doesn't happen anymore because of Jesus' death and resurrection to bind us all to him. And what they heard was, I support liberal politics. Why, are, why is the reading of scripture literally being, you think it's political? Because you've been conditioned by greater voices. That any word that sounds like love the poor, love the immigrant, love racially different sounds like your political voice versus the voice of Jesus and Paul and the scriptures. So we do not follow our party's voice. It doesn't mean it's always wrong, though it probably is regardless of what side you're on. But maybe they get by accident something right. 
but it means that I, I, I always tell people what I want to be is I want to be a prophetic voice so that when even if something somebody I agree with starts to go off the rails, I have enough integrity to go, even my own party, no. No, no, no. That is not what my Lord would say. Do I have enough prophetic separation to even to the people I like and agree with to go, nope, not my Lord. Secondly, what voice should you follow? Not the public's voice. There's uh, one of the, so what I mean by this is you're surrounded by a zeitgeist. That means the spirit of the age. You don't have to have agreed in principle on certain things to have been imbued with certain values. You don't have to have read, I always say this to you, you don't have to have read psychology and philosophy to then carry all the beliefs of Nietzsche and Freud because they're embedded into our culture now. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a philosopher named T Charles Taylor. He's one of our few like greatest modern philosophers. Not dead. And he talks about this thing called a social imaginary. And what he talks about is that you, there are certain laws and constructs in your society that you have no idea that every day you're passing by and you're speaking and there's assumptions made that it becomes a part of the way you see the world and it becomes the dominant leading voice of your life and you are so unaware. I'm going to give you a picture. This is not an opinion piece. I'm just giving you an example. Boss and lady boss. Harmless, funny, I could see one, some of our staff members here having one of these, not me, right? But what is it implicitly saying? Regardless of what you believe about this, what is it implicitly saying? It's saying, who is assumed to be the boss? Men. And who has to then separate and differentiate that they are lady bosses? Now, you can read it and go, oh, that's so empowering, yada, yada, whatever. But at the end of the day, whatever you believe about that, that message is funny, and yet it's telling you a way in which our society should or is set up, right? So whatever you believe about it, you're being imbued every day with little messages like this that you don't know. You just look at it and go, that's kitschy. That's cute. Ooh, I feel empowered, lady boss. But you've accepted, actually, a concept without even thinking about it. And what Charles Taylor is saying is in a social imaginary, he's, he's saying we've constructed a whole system of laws and beliefs that all of a sudden you're starting to think this way. So the question then is what are the geographical and cultural spirits you've picked up of your age without you even knowing it? What about your view of individualism? That this life is about you, about your success. Is that a biblical voice? Or did you pick that up? by every single sign and image and song that you listen to? What about your view of romance and sexuality? That it's primary, that this is what fulfills you. Where did you get that? Did you get that from ancient wisdom? Did you get that from the scriptures, that that's the prime reality? Or did you get it because it's just imbued in everything you watch, housewives and mumble rap about value and money? Where did you get that? And you don't have to sit down and read a book ever to assume the public voice of your time. What about your rights? What about the things that you say are valuable? Did you get that from the voice of Christ? Right? Did you get that from the scriptures, from the Holy Spirit? Or did you just absorb it because you watched Something over and over again. All these messages are on everything you watch, whatever they are. All these messages are on everything you listen to. All these messages. I was walking through an uh, airport in Denver, and I, I'm working on this concept for next year on, on a sermon series, and it's about the self. And I'm walking through, and I see three signs that are like, you can be you. Live, you, li live everything you dream. I mean, these are just plaster through the airport. Do you notice them? No, but are you reading them? And if you get a million of those messages throughout the year, are you sure the public's voice isn't what's leading you? Right? 
The third one's kind of like it. It's the personal voice. Your personal voice often is shaped by the public voice. But it could be positive or negative. You could be self-esteem pumping yourself up. You are good. You are beautiful. If you're on Peloton, you a queen. That's the one I listen to when I'm riding the bike. I'm a queen. Don't let your crown get dirty. Right? I'm just kidding. I don't do Peloton. Um, you could be pumping yourself up, but maybe that's not true. We always talk about this in the office. It's like, I felt so good because they were pumping me up. I'm like, but what if you're not a queen? What if you're kind of wretched? Is that the voice you need right now to be told you're doing well? I don't think that's fair because I'm going to disagree, and then we're going to have a fight because somebody's been telling you you're wearing a crown every day. Right? Maybe that's not the voice, but maybe your voice is negative, your personal voice, which is like you're trash, you're awful, you're behind, you haven't met the objectives of your life, you're failing as a father. Whatever it is, maybe that's your personal voice, some of it influenced by your public surroundings and expectations for sure. But nonetheless, is that the voice of Scripture? Does Scripture endlessly tell you how amazing you are? If anybody says yes, can I tell you, we have a study, we have a study called How to Study the Bible. Uriah teaches it. You need to get in it now because it does not tell you that. But does it always tell you how awful you are like your best pastor when you were younger? Does it tell you just you're trash? Does it tell you you're a failure because you've done things poorly at times? It doesn't do that either. So what voice are you listening to? We have a tendency, most of you might agree with this to some extent. You might go, yeah, see, I know it. Especially in this day and age, we're anti-authority, anti-institution, right? So you would agree with this. You would go, yeah, I don't listen to no one. I don't listen, I don't listen to the politics. I don't listen to people. I don't listen to my pastor. I don't listen to no one. But what are you saying? I listen to me. So you're the shepherd. See, you've confused it because you're so anti, I'm not a sheep, which is fine, I get it. I don't want to be a sheep to people either. But you're so, I'm not a sheep to people that you're also not a sheep to God. You don't recognize there is one whose voice is greater than mine, who is not here to twist me and hurt me and take from me. And so you become the shepherd of your own life even though you're a sheep. And you know where sheep who think they're shepherds go? I don't know, they're lost. I don't know where they go. Because they wander off with no guidance. They have no path, they have no direction. They're probably being eaten as mutton by wolves. See, we might like the sound of the Lord is my shepherd, but we don't. Because you know what that means? That there's a voice who leads me where to go today and every day. And I'm the shepherd. I listen to my voice. But here's the one I want to focus on, and it's not a joke. What voice should you follow? Not even your pastor's voice. One of the things that comes up a lot around here, we always joke that this is a church for recovering Christians. Amen? What that means here is we recognize that a lot of people who come to Redeemers have come from places where you were taught poorly, you were abused in the name of God, you were put down, you have baggage with what it means to be a Christian, a Christ follower. You had people who abused their authority, their power, their power. God willing, it wasn't sexual abuse, but for some of you that might have even been it, as we see that in institutions everywhere, including the church. But perhaps... It was sexist abuse, telling you you belong in the kitchen. Perhaps it was religious abuse in the sense of you're not good, you're not good, you don't do enough. 
See, you got to have enough separation between what the word, you got to know the voice of Christ so well that even those who say they speak for Christ, you know when it's wrong. Because we are twisted, us pastors. We are. We're filled with self-interest, self-righteousness. Some people come into this job because they really started out wanting to really truly help people and care people, but a lot of, just as many come to this job because it represents some type of power. You don't know what you're going to get. And some of us started out right, but it goes to your head. There's so many things that can go wrong that you need to know Scripture. It doesn't mean you shouldn't trust anybody ever. It means you need to know Scripture. So when a, somebody gives you a prophetic word, you know the difference between BS and the Word of God. BS stands for Bible study. <laughs> you know that you need to do Bible study on the Word of God. Thanks. <laughs> Um, and that's why Jesus says here, he's talking to Pharisees, religious leaders, scribes, people who know the word of God, and he's telling them, like, you guys are trying to get in through other ways other than the Son of God. You're saying things religiously. He goes, those who come in any other way than the gate, that which is Jesus, they're thieves and robbers. They come to steal, they come to kill, and they come to destroy. Just put it this way. They come to take from you, not give to you. They might come in the nature of saying, oh, I want to give something to you. Here's some food. But they're actually coming to get from you. In John 20, which we'll get to sometime next year, um, Peter has failed Christ. He's denied him. And Christ returns from his resurrection and he meets Peter on a beach. That's where I hope I get rep reprimanded is on a beach. And Jesus looks at him and goes, Peter, he calls him back into ministry. He calls him Peter by name. He says, come back. He goes, do you love me? And Peter's like, I love you, Lord. And three times he goes, then go feed my sheep. Go feed my sheep. Go feed my sheep. He's giving him this commission by name. Peter, I'm calling you. Go feed my sheep. I want to show you something else. In 1 Peter, it talks about elders. Elders of the church are like pastors. In fact, I'll even tell you that as a general rule, as far as I can say biblically, there's not really a lead single pastor model in the Bible about a group of people that God has put over a church as to pastor the church. Pastor coming from this word of shepherding. Okay? But listen to what it says. Therefore I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, not forcing people to do good, not guilting people to do good, but voluntarily according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, not for what you get out of it, not to increase your cash flow, not to increase your ego so you feel more spiritual, not to get a front parking spot beyond everybody else. But with eagerness, no, yet, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. I just want to point out whose flock? What does it say? The flock of... I will tell you this. I've learned to not cringe at the idea that I'm a sheep. But I still cringe when I hear pastors say, my flock. My flock, my flock. You are not sheep, and I am a shepherd. I am a sheep. I am part of God's flock. You are part of God's flock. 
when a pastor leads or a leader leads you, he is not put in to establish his own rule and power and might over you. He is put in to do what Jesus would do if he was as the true shepherd. And what did Jesus do? He served. He put people first. He died for them. He lays down his life for the sheep. Anybody who has abused you has lost sight of whose flock it is. They've lost sight of what Jesus did as a leader and a shepherd. Anybody who thinks they have prominence over you, of some spiritual power over you, that is not the voice of God. Anyone who says you have to submit who you're dating to me, that's not the voice of God. He is your shepherd. Now, that doesn't mean only God can judge me like Tupac. Because you actually have to listen to him for him to judge you. So if you're not listening to God, then he can't judge you because you're not listening. It means I want the shepherd to judge me, but I've but I got to know the difference between what you're saying and what the true shepherd said. Right? And I'm saying all this because it can get twisted so hard, so bad, and I'd say weekly we hear from people going, I got baggage from religion. I got baggage from my church. And it's because somebody misunderstood that you are not mine. When Jesus is talking about this, he's, he says, All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. You see what it's saying? It's saying all they care about is what I get out of you, of your submission to my power or authority. And that is not the thief. That is, that is the thief and robber, not the, not the one following the true shepherd. Uh, when Jesus is talking about this, he's, he, he's kind of reflecting back on an old prophetic book called Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 34, this is what it says. God is talking to the people of Israel. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take, shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. There was no true shepherd. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. This is the first time God is like, not the first time, but this is where God is saying like, I am your true shepherd. I will send you one who actually cares and will die for you and put his life on the line for you. And if you get lost, I'm going to search for you. And he's saying all these other people came around and said, ooh, you know what I could get out of you, wool? You know what I can get out of you? You could help us with parking team. Ooh, you know what I can get out of you? You're a good worship leader. I could get a lot out of you. They're saying you look at the sheep and go, what can I get for us, for me, for mine? And he's like, no, you've left these people to wander and to be used. Because I'm the true shepherd. I go after a lost sheep because I want them. Because I love them. If you ever hear someone saying, don't question me, you're not following the voice of God. So you are not my flock. There's an example that I was given. Um, an old biblical teacher friend of mine, a colleague, he wrote a book on this actually. He talks about an under-shepherd. That's those who serve a shepherd's flock as pastoral ministry goes. But he actually uses a great example of what's called a bell sheep. Um, and the bell sheep was interesting because what a shepherd would do is he would find there were sheep who 
actually learned to follow the path that the shepherd was leading, and he was able to trust them to follow the path. And so he would find these sheep who were actually, okay, they'd taken some steps, they'd learn where they go, they'd learn where there's to pasture, and they would put bells on them and bring them to the front because they found that the other sheep would follow that sheep, and the bell would clang a sound to keep them together and let the shepherd know that they're with him. So here's what I'm saying. They would find sheep who had just done it before, and instead of sending them to go make meat out of them, they would go, I'm keeping those sheep because I want them to be able to lead the others. But don't miss the point. They're sheep. Right? I like sheep too. They're sheep. They're bell sheep. I'm a sheep. I'm not stupid. I ask a lot of questions. I get off course a lot. I'm ADHD. But I am a sheep. And the only thing that my job is, is if I've walked this path, maybe ahead of some of you who are newer in, Christ, newer in faith or haven't been yet following closely with Jesus, my job is just to make a clanging sound so that you keep following the shepherd. I am a clanging sound. You agree? Clangy, clangy, clangy. And my job is to make a clanging sound. My job is to try my best to follow the shepherd because he's proven to be wiser than me and to clang as much as I can so that you also know you can trust him. Amen? You don't trust me wholeheartedly. You trust him. I want to show you an example of this video. Uh, maybe you've seen this. There's actually three people who try to call these sheep, um, but if we'll play that real quick. <laughs> this is the last one. I shortened it. So she tries to call the sheep. So in that video, there's three people, I shortened it, but there's three people, a couple guys, this girl, they both try to use the same call to the sheep, and they don't even pay attention. They just keep eating. They're like, nope, nope, not his voice, not his voice, not his voice, until they hear the farmer, the one they know they can trust. And they, go, and they hear his call. He calls their name. And they come running. That's the metaphor Jesus is using. Is those who know the shepherd know you don't just follow any other voice. In fact, you just mind your own business and ignore him. And Jesus says this in verse 4. It says, his sheep follow him, the shepherd, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Right? Here's how you know that you can trust Jesus. Is he gets nothing out of you except your love, except to know you're his and with him. His motive is you. His motive is not your wall. He's not what you offer. His motive isn't for you to be a slave to him. The motive is you. You are the motive. Just like the shepherd who truly loves his sheep, they are in this time, they weren't just animals to be farmed and used. This was a, per, a farmer's whole wealth was in these sheep. Their whole livelihood 
Their, all their possessions were in these sheep. It wasn't like a side project. A shepherd's motive is you. It's not winning. It's not winning a political party. They don't care about you. They just want you to agree with them angrily so that they can win power. They don't care about you. They will trade you in a second. They will move the goalposts on you in a second if it helps them keep their power. It is not the public's voice. They are there to get your clicks so that they can get paid. They are there for you to buy their music and their trash so that they can get rich. Their motive is not you. They don't care what happens to you. They care not for the sheep. What voice should you follow? Jesus, the voice of the true shepherd. Jesus, his motive is you. It's always been you. It's that I want to see you made whole. I want you to have life and have it to the full. His motive has been about you, that you would be free from the power of sin and death. That's how you know who you can trust because he proves it. Here's what he says. It gets a little mixed metaphor here because, that, but because he does say, I am the shepherd, but he also says, I am the gate. And now this seems like he's just mixing metaphors, but he's not. This actually could be one and the same. In eastern sheepfolds, a shepherd would often have this little cutout within this sheep pen, and he at night would lay down in front of the gate so as to keep the sheep from getting out and lost, and so as to keep wolves and predators from getting in and killing them. He, us he literally used his own body to save you. His motive is you. That's what he gets out of it. Your salvation. And he says, whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go out and they will find pasture, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy and take from you. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, that's how you know the difference. The people that you're listening to, you know what they're asking of you? For you to lay down your life for them to set aside your priorities for them, to buy their stuff, not others, to spend more time on them in your culture and in your politics and in your powers. Even yourself, when you listen to your personal voice, you know what it's all about? It's about you. In your case, your motive is you. That wasn't God. His motive was you, not him. That's why he died. That's why he laid down his life for you. You have a shepherd who knows how easily you get lost. You have a shepherd who knows how easily you fall down. How easily you are led astray into dangerous places. And he looks to you and he lies down in front of the sheep pen for you because he cares for you. You are his wealth. You are his great possession. You are his purpose. Like when are we going to see? When we read about Jesus, he uses this metaphor over and over again. When are we going to see that he says, you know, even if I have 99 and one gets lost, he goes, that stupid sheep, I'm going after him. I'm taking my life for the, you see the stupidest one? That stupid one who can't even follow the group? He's, he's so important to me. He's so valuable to me. I will leave 99 sheep to go find that one. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? That's how you know who to follow. It's the only one who says there is no one of less value. This is not about simply what I get out of it. This is about you. I want to save you. And every single one of you matters to me.
Every single person who has ever been created, every life matters to me. And I will lay my life down in front of predators to protect you. I have come, so what is my purpose? I have come for what? So that you might have life and have it to the full. That's his motive. And this is what he says at the end. I love this, and this is going to be how we close. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. I want to break this down into two pieces. Those two pieces right there. The Lord is your shepherd. Not your pastor. Not your personal voice. Okay? The Lord is your shepherd. And he says, I know you. I know you by name. Ask your neighbor their name if you don't know them. Go ahead. And tell them. Tell them. God knows that already. God knows your name. Some of you here are the one. We're all stupid sheep. You're the stupidest. I've been that. I've been a wanderer, lost, thinking I knew what I was doing, thinking this world was about me. And God called my name. I was in college because I was brilliant. And I knew things about how the world's supposed to work. And I knew exactly where I was going. And I was all into my looks and into myself. And I was a stupid, stupid sheep. Just being led by everything around me. And one precious night, God spoke to me directly through miraculous means because he knows my name. Out of seven billion people, God interceded on Nick's behalf. He knows your name. And the only reason you don't hear him is because you're listening, listening to everything else. He is calling for you right now. He knows some of you don't know him at all right now. He is calling your name. He wants you to hear his voice like we read scripture. He is calling out, going, you're so convoluted with all the crap that you're listening to. I'm trying to talk to you. I have never stopped calling for you. I have never stopped searching for you. Do you hear my voice? Do you have ears to hear it? It's such a mind trip that I can be a, a speck in this universe of seven billion people and God calls my name and yours. And the only reason I can't receive the call is because I don't know the shepherd's voice. I'm not listening. I'm not looking for it. Some of you have been Christians, but you still don't know his voice and you know it. You go with anything that sounds good out there. You go with this idiot saying if you're poor, you need to give more so you won't be poor. You go with these people who are pimping you in your poverty. You go with people who promise you things that God never promises. It's time to hear his call. To take his call seriously, he knows your name. But the second part is, he says, and my sheep know me. You won't know that he's calling you if you're not listening. If you don't know the scriptures, if you don't have time for the word of God, if you don't have time for a mentor to walk you through, if you don't have time for classes that will embed you in the scriptures, if you don't have time 
for even this sermon right now, because your mind is in a thousand places about yourself, you will never know the character and nature of the one who calls you. And it's by his Holy Spirit and by his divine word, we can know his voice. And then no matter what we hear, we can go, that's not it. I don't care if you're my political party. That's not it. He doesn't talk like that. He doesn't treat people like that. He doesn't divide people like that. That's not my Lord. You don't, when you hear your personal voice, you go, that's not my Lord. I'm not trash. Or whenever you hear, man, I'm so awesome compared to these people. That's not your Lord either. You got to know the Father. You got to know the Shepherd. Do you know Him? He is calling you to come know Him. He's calling your name. I'm going to offer you an opportunity here. If you have not had your name called and you have not been following the true shepherd, I'd like to invite you to make a decision to follow Christ now into faith, into baptism, into the leading of his Holy Spirit in your life. Is there anybody who would like to receive Christ now? You're tired of waiting. You know he's calling your name. He's hitting your heart. He's telling you it's time. Anybody can't see very well out here. But you know it's time to follow Christ closer and tune out everything else. Okay. So you all know his voice? Good. Are you following it? Are you listening for it? When 2024 comes around, none of you are going to act like fools, right? Because you know his voice. Right? Not here. Because we know his voice. We know his character. We know where he would go, where he wouldn't go. We know to those he would love. We know who he is because we know his voice. Many of you, you have been abused in the church, and by proxy, as a pastor, I'm just here to tell you, I hope it brings some healing. You deserved a better shepherd. You've been abused, and your true shepherd hurts for you. Those were thieves and robbers. And he is calling you now to find healing, because his motive is you. Amen? Amen? If you'll close, we're going to stand for the reading of Scripture. I'm going to open to Psalm 23. A Give declaration him the Let's of shut war. it out. Oh, yeah. Let's turn it off. Let's shut them up. Let's stop listening to all the junk. And let's listen closely to the Psalm 23 as we close here and pay attention to his words. He wants to talk to you. One through four. The Lord is my shepherd. Say it with me. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff they comfort me. Thank you, Lord, for being the true shepherd, God. Thank you, God, that 
you speak to our hurts and our pains and our lostness, our wandering. Thank you, God, that you go after the stupidest of us, the one, Lord, that you go after every one of us, Lord, that you call us by name. Thank you, God, that you see me amongst seven billion people. Thank you, God, that you direct our paths. Thank you, Lord, that no matter how many times I've wandered away, you come and pull me back. Thank you, God, that every single person here is known by you. And, Lord, I pray that they would know you. Lord, the same way you say you know Jesus and Jesus knew his disciples, Lord. The same prayer is, Lord, the way he knows you, that they would know you. That we would know you. Lord God, I pray that your Holy Spirit leads us to hear your voice, to reject everything that is not of you, to know you so well that you speak to us and lead us daily. God, for those who maybe are wrestling with that nudge that they know you're calling them to a different life, to a different path, God, and they have been ignoring your voice, Lord, I pray that you would just do whatever it takes in their life to get them off the path to destruction to the path that brings full life. God, we just pray these things in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. May God's grace and peace be with you this week.